Chapter 5, Part 3 The private detectives shared what they knew with Bill Smith, who was still leading his own investigation. The 29-year-old had been a horse thief before attaching himself to an Osage fortune, first by marrying Molly's sister Minnie, and then by marrying Molly's sister Rita only months after Minnie's death from the mysterious wasting illness in 1918. When, when Bill drank, he was known to hit Rita. A servant later recalled that after one fight between Bill and Rita, she came out of a bruised, she came out of kind of, of bruised up. Rita often threatened to leave him, but she never did. Rita had a sharp mind, yet those close to her thought of her judgment was impaired by what, by what, by what one person described as a love that was truly blind. Molly had her doubts about Bill. Had he in some way been responsible for Minnie's death? Hale made it clear that he didn't, didn't trust Bill either. And at least one lo local lawyer thought that Bill was abusing the sacred bond of marriage for a sordid gain. But since Anna's murder, Bill had, by all appearances, tried hard to find the culprit. When Bill learned that a tailor in town might have might have information, he went with a private detective to ask him questions, only to find that he was spreading the now familiar rumor that Rose Osage had killed Anna in a fury of jealousy. Desperate for a break, the private detectives decided to eavesdrop on Rose and her boyfriend. At the time, laws governing electronic surveillance were not well defined, and the detectives installed a dictograph, a primitive listening device that could be tucked in, in anything from a clock to a, to a chandelier. The detectives hiding in another room began to listen to the, to, the, to the voices of Rose and her boyfriend through earphones, which were really staticky. But as so often the case with surveillance, the rush of excitement gave way to the boring details of other people's daily lives. The private eyes eventually stopped bothering to jot down the meaningless information that they overheard. Using more conventional means, however, the detectives made a startling dis discovery. The cab driver who taken Anna to Molly's house on the day she vanished told them that Anna had asked him to stop first at the cemetery in Gray, in Gray Horse. She had climbed out and stumbled to her father's tomb. For a moment, she stood near the spot where she, too, would soon be buried, as if offering a morning prayer to herself. Then she returned to the car and asked the driver to send someone to bring flowers to her father's tomb. She wanted his grave to always be pretty. While they continued to Molly's house, Anna leaned toward the driver. He could smell alcohol on her breath as she divulged a secret. She was going to have a little baby. My goodness, no, he replied. I am, she said. Is that so? Yes. Detectives later confirmed the, the story with two people close to Anna. She had also confided to them the news of her pregnancy, yet no one knew who the father was. One day, that summer, a stranger showed up in Gray Horse to offer his help to the private eyes. The man who was armed with a 44 caliber snub-nosed English Bulldog revolver was named A.W. Comstock, and he was a local attorney and the guardian of several Osage Indians. Some locals thought Comstock, with his broad, curvy nose and tan complexion, might be part, of, part American Indian an impression that he did little to discourage. The fact that he represented himself to, to be an Indian would make him get along pretty well with Indians, wouldn't it? Another lawyer skeptically re remarked, given Comstock's many contacts among the Osage, the private eyes now took, took him up on his offer. While the detectives were trying to make a connection between the slangs of Charles Whitehorn and Anna Brown, Comstock passed on tidbits that he collected from his network of informants. There was talk that Whitehorn's widow, Hattie, had been um, after her husband's money. Talk that she'd been jealous of his relationship with another woman. 
Was it possible that this woman was Anna Brown? And if so, was Whitehorn the father of her, of her baby? The detectives began to follow Hattie Whitehorn around the clock, but nothing came of it. By February 1922, nine months after the murders of Charles Whitehorn and Anna Brown, the investigators seemed to have hit a dead end. Pike, the detective Hale had hired, had moved on. Sheriff Freeze also was no longer heading up the cases. He had, he had been forced from office after a jury had found him guilty of failing to enforce the laws against gambling and bootlegging. Then, on a frigid night that same month, William Stepson, a 29-year-old Osage champion steer roper, received a call that prompted him to leave his house in Fairfax. He returned home to his wife and two children several hours later, but he was visibly ill. Stepson had always been in, re in remarkable shape, but within hours he was dead. Authorities, upon examining his body, believed that someone had met that he had met while he was out had slipped him a dose of poison, possibly strychnine, which was extremely lethal. By the time steps of Stepson's death, scientists had, had invented many tools to detect poison in, corpse, in a corpse. Yet in much of the country, including Osage County, there, was, there were no coroners trained in forensics, and testing for toxic substances was rarely done. Poisoning was thus a perfect way to commit murder. Unlike a gunshot, it doesn't make a sound. And the symptoms mimicked natural diseases like cholera or a heart attack. During Prohibition, there were so many accident, accidental deaths caused from wood alcohol and other bootleg whiskeys that a killer could poison a person's glass of moonshine without ever arousing suspicions. On March 26, 1922, Less than a month after Stepson's death, an Osage woman died after uh, died of a suspected poisoning. Once again, no thorough blood test was performed. In another incident, Joe, Joe Bates, an Osage man in his 30s, got some whiskey from a stranger and after taking a sip, began frothing at the mouth before collapsing. He too had died of what authorities described as strange poisoning. He left behind a wife and six children. That August, as the number of suspicious deaths continued to climb, many Osage con convinced Barney McBri McBride, a wealthy 55-year-old white oil man, to go to Washington, D.C. and ask fed federal authorities to investigate. McBride had been married to a Creek Indian who had died and was raising his stepdaughter. He had taken a strong interest in American Indian affairs and was trusted by the Osage. A reporter described him as kind of a reporter described him as kind-hearted and white-haired. Given that he knew many officials in Washington, he was considered an ideal messenger. When McBride checked in to a, ro a rooming house in the Capitol, he found a telegram from an associate waiting for him. Be careful, it said. McBride carried with him a Bible and a 45 caliber revolver. In the evening, he stopped at an Elks club to play billiards. When he headed outside, someone seized him and tied a burlap sack tightly around his head. The next morning, McBride's dead body was found in Maryland, stabbed and beaten. All his clothes had been taken except for his socks and shoes, which held a card with his name. The forensic evidence suggested that, that there had been more than one attacker, and police suspected that his killers had followed him from Oklahoma. The news quickly reached Molly and her family. The killing, which the Washington Post called the most brutal crime in, in the annuals in the, uh, in the district, appeared to be more than a simple murder. It had been the, uh, the hallmarks of a message, a warning. In a headline, the Post noted what seemed to be increasingly clear, conspiracy believed to kill rich Indians. And I will read chapter six next week. Click on the link and if you're not a subscriber please subscribe I would appreciate it thank you so much